Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, Journalists Roundtable. Attorney General Tom Horn continues to deny allegations made by a former staffer, and a new poll of likely Republican primary voters offers encouraging results for Doug Ducey. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times, Mike Sonnix of the Phoenix Business Journal, and Bob Christie of the Associated Press. Attorney General Tom Horn files an official response to claims of violating campaign and election law. We should mention that uh, General Horn was on the program here Tuesday evening. If you want to watch that online, it's uh, there for you. Uh, the response seemed to be similar to what he said uh, here Tuesday night. Jeremy, uh, I didn't do it. <laughs> that was basically the gist of it, but um, a lot more detail than that. Of course, the allegations against him are that he's basically running his re-election out of his, camp, out of his uh, office, using uh, AG's office staff on uh, taxpayer time. He says none of that happened, you know, all substantive campaign meetings. He says we go over to the Arizona Rock Products Association, let us use a conference room. Um, Sarah Beattie, the woman who filed this complaint, the former employee, said, you know, submitted a bunch of emails that uh, all, many of them looked like they were done during the work day. He said, well, they were done during breaks. Really, these, none of these emails would have taken more than a few minutes to write. And if you, you know, it's over a six month span, it's less than two emails per person. He tried to poke some holes in some other parts of her argument. She claimed that she spent, he was hired solely for campaign purpose and spent an average of about two hours a day doing actual AG's office work. He said, you know, based on her work output and discussions with her supervisor, that's simply not possible. Um, he attacked her credibility at several turns. He had affidavits from other employees attacking her, including her original supervisor. He said, oh, she was such a terrible employee. Of course, she got a promotion at about $13,000 worth of raises within a month of that. So I don't know what that says. <laughs> it was very much shoot the messenger type thing. They, they did go after her, mentioned her possible background uh, with some drug use, worked as a stripper. She had some back run-ins with some past employee, employers. And it's a typical thing that some folks do when they go after whistleblowers is to discredit her. And there's a lot of affidavits, like Jeremy said, from, from Horn Aids, you know, going after her story. So, but, but this is a bad narrative for Tom because he's had a lot of these problems uh, over the past year with the campaign finance group and the coordination. And for the public, they don't really read the complaints. They just see stories and he's having to address this. And it's a he said, she said thing. But it's a bad thing for someone that's running for, for re-election because you have an opponent in Mark Brnovich who has a lot of dark money uh, behind him, a lot of conservatives behind him. And then you got Felicia Rodolini, who Democrats kind of see as the second coming as, of Janet Napolitano. <laughs> so he's got a lot of people willing to attack him this time, and the bad press doesn't help. Right, and Tom's best bet is that the Secretary of State and the Clean, Elect Clean Elections Commission throw out these complaints. You know, the bar is really low f for them to accept them and decide that an investigation needs to be done. And if that happens, uh, it's just going to drag out and out and out, and we're going to be writing about this for another six months. So it is, it, I think, you know, as as Mike said, it's it's looking bad for Tom Horn as far as the press. And there's also a danger of going after her so personally and going after this. You know, you're, you're, you're especially in the general, let alone the primary. You have, you can, I think, the Democrats will make a big issue of Tom and his relationship with women he works mm -hmm. with. Um, and and so to go after somebody like this, you run the danger of, of a backlash of voters saying, "Wow, this is how personal you get." Yeah, remember, the primary isn't that far away. It is August 26th, and like Bob mentioned, this is going to drag on. If they accept this complaint, which you know, it seems like they'll investigate. I mean, they're going to dismiss this out of hand. You know, this is going to drag on through the primary. It doesn't really, in the end, it might not even matter if they find anything or not. They might not have a chance to do so until after the primary, at which point he might have already lost and it won't really matter if he's been exonerated. Does it matter that uh, both on the show and in the, the filing of the response to the complaints seem to have an answer for everything up to and including the idea that Brett Meekham worked 20 hours uh, over the course of two days, seemingly, allegedly, on a campaign flyer? He says the guy left his computer on overnight. Yeah, I think I think Tom. You know, it was a pretty exhaustive defense um, uh, of, of her allegations. I, I think what it comes down to is whether this resonates with voters. Voters aren't going to get into the, the the he said she said thing and the affidavits, but but are they going to see this as a narrative about about the attorney general? And boy, it's time for him to go. Or are voters is this so inside baseball like the campaign finance coordination uh, that that voters don't connect the dots and don't really 
think this is a big deal, this is politics. I mean, I think a lot of voters, if you ask them, do, do elected officials have their, their staff work on elections? They think yes, they would think everyone does that. Whether they walk across the street or they do it on a break at their, at their work computer, I think most voters are cynical enough to think, well, sure. So, but I think the personal nature of it could, could be, back, be a backlash. Well, I think one of the possibly the most interesting thing in this response is, you know, there's mention of this uh, binder that was uh, full yes. of contributor information that was intentionally mislabeled Border Patrol, which uh, Sarah Beatty, you know, had and lost and then realized she, realized she had it and didn't tell anyone, and now, you know, her attorney's already turned it over to the FBI. But uh, Tom Horn said, well, she, you know, this went missing in like late January or February, which shows that for at least her last four months, she was working for our opponents, which I think shows kind of a paranoid mindset. I mean, Tom Ryan, Sarah Beatty's attorney, compared him to Evan Meekham at that point, and well, you know, no one wants that. Char right. That charge, along with the idea that the liberal media, and I, apparently that includes just about everyone, is out to get Tom Horn. They sure are. Uh, I had an interview with him a couple weeks ago when the Alvi County attorney reinstated the, the coordination complaint, and in the middle of the interview, and I'm, you know, I'm known to be a tough questioner, you know, he stopped and said, you're a member of the liberal media, and I kind of went, well, it's not about me, Tom, it's about you, let's get back on track. So that will resonate with voters who, who are his base, though. I mean, if he comes out and says, if you don't believe any of this stuff, it's the liberal media painting me as, uh, as a, a bad person, don't believe them, believe me. And okay, uh, with that in mind, you talked about his base and you talked about election potential here. This new poll by Magellan Strategies and Auto Dial Survey, so this is likely Republican voters here, but the auto dial, you, you know, take it for what it's worth here. Uh, only 26% of Republicans likely to vote in the primary would vote for Tom Horn today, 43% for Brnovich, and at least half of those folks that are voting for Brnovich don't even know who he is. Yeah, some of those numbers wouldn't surprise me, and certainly wouldn't surprise me if Brnovich is up on Horn now, especially after the last, you know, five or six weeks that he's had. I know this poll in particular, and, um, you know, the group that put this poll out, they put one out a few weeks ago as well. There's a lot of skepticism about that. Mm -hmm. It was put out by a pro Doug Ducey independent expenditure group, and it magically showed him in its first, in its first poll jumping from like 9% to more than double the support of any other candidate. Now, you know, be that as it may, I think, you know, some of those uh, AG numbers could be a little telling, even, you know, if they're kind of off. You know, the first poll a few weeks ago showed pretty much a neck-and-neck -neck race, and now it shows Brnovich with a big lead, even though nobody knows who he is. But it also showed that most of the response, I think 95 percent, did know who Tom Horn was. I think historically the media, the, the insiders in town have underestimated Tom Horn. He's been a good campaigner. He beat Andy Thomas in that tough primary. He beat Rodolini last time. He has a pretty good name ID and he's attorney general. So for all these stories that we talk about, there's consumer fraud lawsuits and settlements that he's putting press releases out that are on TV. Tom Horn's doing his job as the state's prosecutor and Mark Brnovich has real low name ID, maybe not a lot of money to, to get his name out there. And you know, for us, for us folks as insiders, there's a tipping point and voters are going to get tired of that. But, but maybe voters will say, hey, I know Tom Horn. I know that name. I don't know this other guy. I'm going to stick with him, at least in the primary. Yep. All right, let's get to this, back to this poll, this Magellan strategy. You say a lot of folks have questions regarding it, and it could be Ducey-centric. Uh, um, amazingly enough, among likely Republican primary voters, Doug Ducey gets 28%, 12% more than the runner-up Scott Smith, uh, Christine Jones at 12%, Ken Bennett at 12%, 23% still undecided. Do we take what? Do we take anything at all? The, uh, Ducey has 91% name ID in that poll. I don't, I don't know if Jan Brewer has 91% <laughs> name ID. Probably, it's a, those are Vladimir Putin type, <laughs> type numbers. Uh, this group is, is out of Colorado. There's ties to the Koch brothers, ties to then Sean Noble, who is the dark money guy, who's been a, a Ducey and Brnovich ally. So there's a lot of skepticism toward this. A lot of people think Ducey is a legitimate front runner type contender, top two or three. Um, but, but for him to be up that much with that kind of name ID, I think a lot of people are, 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 are casting doubt on this. And the poll shows 90% turnout among those surveyed. I think they surveyed 650 some odd folks. And it was a telephone push poll. You pick up the phone and there's not a real person there. There's a recording and you push buttons. They're relatively unreliable type of polling. Um, and 90% uh, turnout in an off year primary race. Yeah. La I looked at 2010's primary. 30% turnout. Yeah. So you look at those numbers and you kind of roll your eyes and say, pretty far off probably. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Ducey's numbers probably are going up right now. He's been on TV for a little over a month now. He's the only candidate on TV, I think, right now because Christine Jones uh, seemed to have this kind of bizarre media strategy of going up for a few weeks with ads and then going down. So he's the only one on the air. He's advertising. I'm sure that's moving the needle, but 
Right. Double digit, digit lead, I'm not so sure. Right. And Ducey's on the radio now, too. I heard him on the way to work this morning on, a, on one of the talk radio stations, and, and he was attacking illegal immigration because of the, the migrants being brought here. And he was, uh, you know, it was right on, on a topical issue. Well, and let's mention some numbers that we can kind of count on here, and that's fundraising. Uh, first fundraising period of 2014, Ducey and Smith both pulled in uh, about a million dollars each. Uh, gives Ducey, I think, two million for the campaign. How much he can use in the primary in general, we're still kind of confused about here. Uh, but that means Smith has raised a million dollars in about five months. He's got a lot of business support. He's the next real estate executive. Uh, he, the business folks love him. He brought Apple uh, to Mesa, built a new Cubs Stadium. A lot of the developers, uh, uh, a lot of political consultants really like him. The business community uh, <laughs> is really split between <coughs> Ducey and, and Smith. So those are, those are the money folks. Those might not be the voters in the primary, but those are the guys that get you the, the money to put the ads up and the mailers. And so uh, they both did pretty well. So did Duval. They report pretty good numbers. I was going to say Fred Duval between 900000 and a million dollars cash on hand, all of it, because he hasn't got anything to worry about here. So he's got a little over a million dollars in his war chest. And he just basically sits back and says, you guys go have at it. Uh, yeah, they's, they're certainly enjoying watching the Republicans, you know, beat the tar out of each other. But in terms of cash on hand, not all of it. You know, he raised about $800,000 during the first reporting period in 2013. They now say about $900,000, you know, since the January 1st. That's about $1.7 total, million total. They have $1.1 million on hand, they say, which means... Something's he spent six hundred thousand dollars with no primary, no TV advertising. And I know a lot of people, a lot of my sources on both sides of the aisle, are really scratching their heads and saying, "How in the world has this guy spent six hundred thousand dollars already?" Where's right. it been going? Um, a lot of it towards organizing. Um, you know, they got, they, you know, they weren't paying for signatures, but they're hiring a lot of organizers, a lot of laying the groundwork you, kind of stuff. Can you do that if you know that you really don't have to hit the home stretch until you hit the home stretch? I mean, he's got one race to run, not two. No, sure. In a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of expenses you know you're going to have, like the organizing, like setting up that ground game. You know you can front load a lot of that. If you know you can just cruise through the August 26th primary, you know, he's known that for a long time since Chad Campbell was the only other de Democrat really looking at this race. It's a long time ago that he announced that he wasn't. So Duvall's known he can just kind of kick back for a while and bide his time and kind of get everything in place for, you know, the home stretch in uh, he's, November. He's got to get new voters out there. He can't win under the current, the current atmosphere, unless there's a complete da disaster on the Republican side. Um, so he's got to get younger voters, Hispanics out there. You've seen the Gallegos do this uh, uh, in, in the city of Phoenix, and you'll see Ruben kind of try to do this in the, in the race against Wilcox, where you get new voters out there to try to try to move the needle. I think the one thing on the fundraising is to see how much of their own money Ducey, who was the Cold Stone Creamery mm -hmm. CEO, and Christine Jones, who has a lot of cash from her GoDaddy days, yes. how much they decide to put in the race and how much that changes the dynamic there. Right, and that's yeah. going to that's gonna inundate your summer airwaves, folks. Yes. So those who are still in town and haven't, haven't made it to San Diego for a week, uh, you're going to start seeing those ads probably three or four weeks from now. And all that money is going to be spent in the primary because, n you know, the Republicans, there's seven of them in the race, um, they're going to spend all that money because whoever comes out is going to be able to refill those coffers just like that. Yeah, and Ducey, um, you know, he's got a history of self-funding. When he ran for treasurer in 2010, he spent, I think, you know, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars out of his pocket. I don't think he's really looking to do that this time around. And you know, you can look at the you know very vigorous fundraising, two million dollars so far. You can tell he really doesn't want to mm -hmm. do that. Christine Jones, that seems like a mostly self-funded operation. And you know, even though the, the fundraising period ended last week, the reports aren't due till the end of this month. Several of these candidates, of course, announced their numbers because you know you want to show off your fundraising. The Jones people wouldn't tell me anything about how much she's raised, how much she's put in, how much she's spent. We're going to have to wait till the end of June, it looks I like, to figure that out. I think that's part of her campaign, out. though, is to not do the fundraisers. She's talking about how she's not part of the good old boys club. She's the only woman in the race. She's not beholden to all these lobbyists and consultants that are working for these other guys. And so she can put her own money in. She can, she can say she can talk to voters and not, and not the fat cats. All right. The acting VA chief was in Phoenix. Uh, apparently now 18 veterans died while waiting for appointments at the VA. 14, though, had contacted for end-of-life care. These are people who died while <coughs> waiting, not died because because they were waiting as far as we know, correct? As far as we know. We do not know the, the new uh, VA, uh, the acting VA head, whose name is Sloan Gibson, uh, replaced Eric Shinshecki last week. He came in this week and in no uncertain terms says, I'm going to clean this mess up. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to come back and personally apologize to these people. Uh, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're, apparently he was shocked that there was several hundred openings at the VA, which hadn't been filled over the last couple of years. Um, you know, we've got backlogs, we don't have enough doctors, and they have positions on the books that they had not filled. So 
he has made some pretty bold statements that uh, he's going to fix the problem. And he says he's going to start firing folks as soon as they get a reform bill through Congress. And voila, it looks like Senator McCain and Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont, uh, quite the liberal fellow here who usually caucuses there with the Democrats, they came up with something, didn't they? Yeah, he's the Sanders is the chairman of the, of the Veterans Committee. They're right, way far left. Um, they want to be able to fire folks quicker. Uh, they want <laughs> some, some reforms to let people that are waiting for care to go outside the system, go to maybe private physicians, maybe build, uh, make 27 more facilities, and try to not have them so concentrated in, in places like Phoenix, where there's been obviously tons of problems. And McCain, you know, uh, worked on this, and he's been kind of out in front, very critical of the administration on this also. He, go ahead, please. No, there's, um, you know, there's a handful of components to this bill. You know, some of them, I think there's a little, as Bernie Sanders, I think, put it, there's a little bit that'll uh, annoy everyone, but um, it's a lot of money. It's about $2 billion. One of the main components is that it would allow, uh, you know, people in the VA system to go outside of the VA system for health care. If the wait is too long, if they live too far, I think more than 40 miles mm -hmm. from, uh, from this, you know, there's a, the House bill that's being considered over there. That, that was just make it easier to fire people, which is also part of this, and it seems like... I think everyone can probably agree on that at this point. Some of this other stuff, you know, could be a little controversial. I mean, Republicans in the House certainly may balk at all the money that's being spent. But, you know, at this point, it's kind of hard to see anyone really trying to obstruct this, considering the firestorm that's erupted over this, considering the election coming up. Well, and we should mention as well that McCain and Ann Kirkpatrick, Representative Kirkpatrick, uh, they both have responded to claims that they either ignored or didn't move fast enough regarding the whistleblower's uh, first contact with them. They did. Senator McCain this week uh, was criticized. There was one line in the paper that said he was slow to act on a complaint from the main whistleblower in the case, which is Dr. Foote. Name, first name escapes me. Sam. Um, Sam. Yeah. And, uh, and he pushed back and said, no, 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 I got, we got the... The contact with him within a day we were two days we reached back out to him um, and he laid out a chronology of his response which seemed to to show that he acted quickly and kirkpatrick did the same she's on the veterans affairs committee in the house she immediately referred it to staff which that's how you do those things i mean if you're on the committee and you get a complaint you go to your staff and you say look into this let's take care of this um, and so she pushed back as well and andy tobin who's one of the republicans in the race against him or criticized her so there are people very nervous about their vulnerabilities on this issue in, in elections and for their political legacies. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of criticism that you put on the, on the administration. It's their, it's their agency. Obviously, this agency, much like CPS, has had a culture of, of problems, of, of poor service, of poor management at a lot of facilities. There's, you can blame Congress as a whole for how they funded things. And really, this is an upswing from the wars. You had a lot of people coming off both wars. Mm -hmm. And you have an aging population. So you have a lot of veterans that are older that are, that are needing care. And obviously, this agency hasn't, hasn't adjusted to that. I think to go after the two lawmakers on whether a constituent <laughs> service person got back you know, I think that misses the mark a little bit. I think there's much bigger fish to fry in terms of blame. All right, there, but please. Well, there might be some concern over really politicizing this. We've already seen this with the VA thing, with um, you know Kirsten Cinema and uh, I think um, David Schweiker were both accused of trying to fundraise off of mm -hmm. this not too long ago. Now we've got, uh, I believe it's Adam Quasman calling on Kirkpatrick to resign over this, which um, yeah, I don't really see that happening. But well. um, you know, this becomes a political football. You know, this is such a bipartisan issue, and VA has become kind of a bipartisan pinata at this point. There might be some thought that it's kind of over politicized. Well, I think Republicans right. think this is an issue that they can they can run on in, in the fall Ab because it's the administration's fault. Absolutely, and, and the last time all th all four of us were together was about four weeks ago. Uh, this was we were still waiting for the for the inspector general's report to come out and and everyone the republicans were telling their folks don't campaign on this we don't know what the outcome is we don't want to politicize veterans issues now the ig reports out and all of it is true all of those uh, all of it and more uh and so there yeah. there's going to be campaign ads on this and you best you you betcha uh before we go cesar chavez is running for congress I know, which is surprising because I thought he'd been dead for about 20 years, but um, he's running for Congress in uh, the, the 7th Congressional District, uh, kind of south of Phoenix, West Valley based. Turns out Cesar Chavez is Scott Fissler, who is a Republican who ran as a write-in against Ed Pastor a couple of years ago. He ran for the city council seat against Laura Pastor last year, and then he changed his name to Cesar Chavez, changed his voter registration to Democrat, and now he is suddenly running in this district. and. Surprise, surprise, people noticed. Is he going to make it onto the ballot? Well, that's a question to see how many, how many signatures he has, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of efforts by both uh, Gallego and, 
and Wilcox to keep him off of there because that race could be very tight. That's going to be a tough race. And if it comes down to a few votes and you have someone with that name on there, you might have some folks that vote for him and it could swing the tide. But but we'll see if he can get on there. I, I don't know if he has enough signatures to make it. Well, he filed, so. Yeah, does he have any, what, what are his positions on anything? Um, I don't know. If you look at his website, there's not really positions. There are pictures of thousands of cheering people uh, waving signs and wearing t-shirts for Chavez. Unfortunately for him, it is the pictures are from Caracas, Venezuela, and those rallies were for f former President Hugo Chavez. So I don't really know what his position is other than, hi, you know my name. It's kind of like the distinguished gentleman. Remember the old uh, Eddie Murphy name? It's the name you know. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that particular name and that particular campaign. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we will have a debate. We'll hear from candidates for the Republican primary in Arizona's first congressional district. A debate Monday evening, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, we will learn about an initiative to help make Phoenix more globally competitive. Wednesday, hear how local food banks have teamed up to help feed the hungry during the summer. Thursday, see how first and second grade students are learning how to make their own apps. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists Roundtable. If you'd like to see past shows, like our interview with Tom Horn this past week, you can check us out azpbs.org slash horizon. That is azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.